Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Everybody, so glad you could join us. Hopefully, we can shed some light on some interesting facts for you tonight. First, I want to uh, thank Ken Quiet Hawk for his amazing intro. Check out Ken and his wife Deb on the internet. They're native storytellers, and they pre- they are preserving an, ama- an amazing and an ancient way of of preserving history, which um, everybody should experience. It's really quite profound, and the two of them are just phenomenally good at what they do, which is, you know, an exciting thing in and of itself. My my guest tonight is Bill Mann. He is the author of The Last Refuge of the Knights Templar. And it's based on a series of recently discovered authenticated letters between two Masonic icons, Albert Pike and William James Bury McLeod Moore who are considered the fathers of Freemasonry in the USA and Canada, respectively. Part fact, part fiction, the novel with its 33 initiatory chapters provides a rare glimpse into the inner circles of modern-day Freemasonry, along with revelations of ancient alliances between Native Americans and the Templars. It's set in Georgetown in the heart of Washington, D.C., And the story ends with a dramatic unveiling of the ultimate new world secret sought by so many factions. The location of the last Knights Templar refuge in the new world, where the lost treasure of the Templars, including sacred knowledge of the Holy Family, the descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, remains to this day. Bill is currently the Supreme Grand Master of the Sovereign Great Priory Knights Templar of Canada, a Christian Masonic National Order. He's also a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason and a 9th degree Rosicrucian and a Knight Companion of the Red Cross of Constantine. He's recently retired as the CAO of a major Canadian municipality, and he's the author of The Knights Templar in the New World, The Templar Meridians, The Templar Sanctuaries in North America. And his main goal in retirement is to enlighten the public in relation to the fundamentals of Freemasonry and to bring the tenets of the worldwide fraternity into a wider, brighter light. It's, uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to have him on the show tonight. Welcome, Bill. Thanks, Barbara. How are you this evening? I am terrific. It's, uh, this is my way of escaping um, into other realities here when I get to talk with people like you about what they've written and why they've written it and it's it's really an adventure for me it's i think part of my retirement which keeps me busier than when i worked and and it feels like your retirement is also busier um somehow if you retire you slow down but if you retire to something more exciting than what your job was life life picks up and it is is quite an adventure it certainly does. It's a, it, yes, it's a, it's an interesting time out there. Um, I don't know what to think about it in, 
in totality, but uh, it gives you a time for reflection and a time for to seek that inner knowledge uh, uh, if, if you're so inclined. Yeah, and, you know, so, so many people um, have so much time on their hands now. Uh, reading your books is not a bad way to spend the time. I do have a question, though. You've, you've written three books before this one. All of them were more or less informational and, and, you know, citing facts and dates and times and things like that. While, while they were telling a story, it was, it was a story that, that was historically um, triggered and, and inspired. And, but yet this book is a novel, but in many ways it has even more historical information in it. Why the, why the shift? Why the change? Well, it's interesting that you picked up on that, and I'm glad that you did. Uh, I, I'm finding that uh, although my books, uh, my three uh, previous books, have been very successful, um, it, it's a case that uh, I always find that uh, a lot more people are, are willing to accept things if you pre- present them almost in a fictional or metaphorical way. And they uh, they grasp onto things because maybe that's the way we've been taught. We've been taught to, uh, as your intro says, uh, to follow the story, to follow the storylines, and to read into it on a, on a number of levels. Maybe that's the way we have. We're more inclined to interpret things, to understand things, uh, uh, both inward and outward. Well, yeah, I I think that's true because. Um... When you read about Prince Henry Sinclair and his journey and, and um, the Chimera documents, um, you get caught up in the story. And I, I do believe that you will remember a story more, and more intricately than you will remember facts that have given to you, boom, 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 boom. So um, You do. And, and, and so, sorry to interrupt. That's... Uh, pretty well the basis of Freemasonry right there through moral allegory, through storytelling, through uh, the conducting of rituals, uh, is there certain morals and certain higher levels of understanding gained through those rituals? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's to me, well, you know, I've, I want to say I've researched, but I haven't really, re- well, I, yeah, I kind of, I have researched I take that back. Um, the 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 story of the of the Templars and coming to this country and 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 their journeys while they're here and and their purposes. Uh, it it you know you read it over and over again in different places in different ways and it becomes more real to you. It does become a story. It becomes uh, a journey. It becomes kind of like. Um, Oh gosh, Hercules and, and uh, Hercule, no Jason and the Argonauts, and you know all of the other uh, stories that that have been preserved in history, um, that 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 are telling you something. But you know you read the story and subliminally you get the message, which is which I, is I really think, cool. I think that's very very true. Um, and uh, in legend and myth, we know there's a there's fact behind legend of this, but people are more willing to accept it, I think, because of the storyline. It's awfully hard for people to uh, to read about hidden history, factual history. They always want the proof. Well, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, like Freemasonry, there's speculative Freemasonry and operative Freemasonry. And uh, it's it's like the Curse of Oak Island. It's like the the fellows that are digging, the two Americans that are digging on Oak Island at this point in time, they they have to find that engineering proof, that science. They keep on repeating. The science is the basis. Well, what they don't uh-huh. appreciate is that there's a, there's a speculative basis or level to the application also. Only when you can apply the two levels do you, do you rise to a higher level of understanding. Well, do you did you find that you had greater flexibility with connecting the dots and making it a novel? Oh, absolutely. 
And one thing that uh, I had to be careful with, um, uh, there's a realization that Albert Pike, especially in the United States, he was a Confederate general. He been implicated in Knights of the Golden Circle, the Ku Klux Klan, the potential or the assassination of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, there are certain factions that uh, really uh, treat him as a demigod. That, that the ultra right would uh, would love to get their hands on these letters because I think that they would interpret them for their own cause. Uh huh. Well, you know, that, so that was I, another I, question. Go ahead. Sorry. So I found I had to uh, not bury the letters, but to just provide snippets of the letters um, uh, within the uh, within the fictional work. So uh, people can, like the, the Da Vinci Code, people can accept what's presented in the Da Vinci Code uh, for the absolute truth, or they can consider it to be fiction or somewhere in between, and that's the, and that's the way I find that you can get the message across um, uh, more readily than uh, than perhaps within uh, hidden history or factual history. It, that was that was another question I wanted to ask you because you do present pieces of the letters in the text. Are these verbatim, or are they edited by you? No, they're verbatim. So um, a lot of people will, uh, if they read, if they read the book carefully and read it over and over again, they'll see that I've written it on so many levels itself. But uh, what they'll find is that there's fascinating glimpses into Albert Pike's life. Uh, I found that as I read the letters myself, they're in sequence, uh, and they really present sort of a an attempt at an atonement, I think, from Albert Pike himself, uh, from his uh, his earlier life. I think he got caught up in a number of things, an association, a number of things, and, and his whole his whole being is being misconstrued in a number of ways. And that's what I'm afraid of that uh, people will take it literally. Well, now were there 33 letters? Yes, there are, which I find okay. fascinating itself because, as you know, there's 33 or 32 degrees in Freemasonry and the 33rd degree is honorary, but there's 33 uh-huh. letters virtually over 33 years. So it equals out to about one letter a year. Uh, in those days, I, I imagine that wasn't unusual in itself, but uh, the sequence of letters I found very um to me, it was very promising, and I realized because of my background of, of number of orders and number of degrees in Freemasonry, I was able to apply it, and I realized that uh, Albert Pike was writing on so many levels himself to uh, now, Colonel William James Burry McLeod Moore, who was like the the founding father of modern-day uh, Knights Templar of Canada. So what... Um, most of the letters, well, Albert Pike and he were sharing or were trying to put together. This I found interesting, that Freemasonry originally, there were so many variations in a lot of the ceremonies that they they were striving to pull it all together so that it was... Um, well, that's the interesting thing that I've I've done a, a unique study on Pike over the last 25 years. I realized what he was trying to do is, especially down in the southern states because of war, nutrition, uh, uh, disease, a number of things, there were a hodgepodge of Scottish Rite, 32 degrees. Uh-huh. And what he was trying to do is he was trying to actually, and he did it, and he reassembled the 32 degrees to constitute Scottish Rite masonry, uh, free masonry of the what's known as the Southern jurisdiction in the in the U.S. So, so he, was he working with um, James Wilson Burry McLeod? That's a long name. Um, I know. Just Colonel call him the Colonel. Just the Colonel. Colonel okay. McLeod. Was he working Moore. with the? 
was he was he working with him in order to put this together? Were they sharing information of rituals and things like that? Now, that's the most interesting thing, and I have uh, other documentation, other uh, uh, written documentation uh, from McLeod Moore proving that. McLeod Moore uh, traveled back and forth between Ireland, Scotland, and England, and he was, uh, he was collecting the, uh, the British ritual, uh, including Scottish Rite ritual in Scotland and Ireland, uh, and Knights Templar, um, York, uh, York Wright Knights Templar, uh, the Irish type. And he was providing McLeod Moore, or he was providing Albert Pike, with a whole series of these degrees, which he collected uh, from Great Britain. And I know so that some, sorry, I know that some uh, Scottish Rite Masons would, uh, would find fault with that. Well, so what position did Albert Pike have? I mean, obviously he was a 32nd or 33rd degree Mason, but what was his position in Masonry at that time in order that he could turn around and do this? Well, Pike was uh, Pike was elected as sovereign grand commander of the uh, Southern Jurisdiction Scottish Rite, so he was absolute grand commander. Uh-huh. Um, so uh, following the Civil War, uh, actually he received a, a pardon from the President of the United States at the time. Um, what, the only pardon to be given to a Confederate general, which is interesting in itself, but. Uh, he went on uh, to be the uh, for a life term the sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction. So he had absolute power. He probably had more power than the President of the United States uh, following the Civil War. I found it fascinating that first of all he was Confederate, but the President gave him a pardon, so he didn't have to turn in his his military rank right that's fa- that's fascinating in itself yes um now why i mean the, come and, on and was... the, well the premise sorry the premise that i'm putting forward in the book is that he possessed something of a of a, a priceless value a secret um that he had rediscovered or he had been given the uh, the tenets to that secret he ha- he possessed that secret, but it was a curse in itself because he really uh, felt the need that he had to share it with somebody, and he shared it with McLeod Moore uh, because McLeod Moore was sort of his counterpart in uh, in Canada, north of the border. Okay, so so um, at the end of the war, so Lincoln's dead, and Johnson as president was. Was Johnson a, a Mason? Uh, yes. He was made a Mason on the orders of Albert Pike. <laughs> so there's a conspir- oh, oh. There's conspiracy throughout the whole book. I found yeah. that fascinating in, in itself also. Because he was the only one that was pardoned. And then he was able to request the post he wanted. Exactly. And interesting enough, he became the Indian agent, the federal Indian agent uh, for the United States, which I found fascinating again because he was pro-slavery, but he also, he, he supported, it's interesting, your introduction to your program in itself, um, he supported the Native cause. Uh, and the Natives actually fought under him uh, during the Civil War, the Cheyenne and the Choctaw. But at that point, he had to be aware of the similarity between their Native American masonry and European masonry. Yes. Yes, but... So, of of course they would. Of, of course, 
he he is fascinating in itself because, and this is a, one of the points that I'm trying to make, is that Pike considered the Native North Americans, the the Algonquin larger nation, the guardians of this of this Knights Templar secret. And it was on the uh-huh. basis that there was a belief that the Knights Templar, through Prince Henry St. Clair and others, actually came to uh, uh, to North America. It wouldn't be known as North America at the time, but came to the new world, per se, uh, in the 13th, 14th centuries. And uh, actually strategically intermarried with the uh, Native population. Man, those Templars were really smart, and so were the the Native. I mean, the First Nation people. I mean, they were amazing. And I'm trying to I'm trying to um, put together time frames. Um, Jefferson, where did he come in as president? Um, well, Thomas Thomas Jefferson. Uh, obviously was the instigator of the Lewis and Clark expedition, right? Right. In the early 1800s. And in part, in part, the belief is that Jefferson was, uh, at one time, he was the, like a foreign minister of the United States to France. And we know Uh that France supported, France supported the, the, Uh, newly formed United States during the American Revolution uh, and itself became a republic. So you have two republics that are exchanging information on many levels and the belief is that Jefferson uh, in his position as foreign minister when he was in France he had gained through certain Masonic lodges uh, also uh, the, an inkling of the secret that uh, the Knights Templar in pre-Columbian times uh, came to North America, established settlements all across uh, uh, Native North America, Turtle Island, and actually uh, uh, deposited what we will call the Templar treasure at the sacred vault at the last refuge of the Knights Templar. And wasn't Meriwether Lewis sent to see whether that vault was still there, among other things? That's the speculation. Well, sounds pretty pretty confirmed to me since when he was going back to report he was murdered. Um, well, that, that's an uh, interesting fact also. So, if you, And this is the whole thing about hidden history. When you start putting it together, it's conjecture. Uh, there's no proof, obviously, absolute proof, but if you put everything together, it's like uh, Sherlock Holmes. You know, if you have one coincidence, it's just a coincidence. If there's 500, that's uh, speculation. Well, how the heck do you commit suicide by shooting yourself twice? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's yeah, you know, it's just hard to figure yeah. So, so the so the fear was that I, the belief is that uh, uh, Lewis had discovered um, or had been led to uh, again inkling, so if not the actual vault at the last uh-huh. refuge in Montana, uh, in Montana, and that he was uh, he was disillusioned with one the treatment of the Native North Americans, the guardians of the vault at the time. But two, uh, he wanted to expose the uh, the vault, um, and that actually Freemasons assassinated him. Yes, so I so I understand the rumor is. Um, it seems to me that that um, you know I I have no doubt that there is a vault someplace and that there is. There are treasures within it. It's, it's just that it's, it depends on what you call a treasure. <laughs> um, but just the um, in in your book, 
um, there is the suggestion that the Vatican, um, you know, really didn't want these these letters exposed, and that um, they wanted to you know, sort of put them away in a vault and hide them someplace so people wouldn't have any idea that, first of all, there was a treasure, and, and then second of all, where it actually was, so that the Jesuits were, you know, uh, trying to hinder the hero and heroine in in every way, you know, in, in every turn they took. And what's interesting is that uh, um, historically, the first teachers of Albert Pike were the Jesuits themselves. But uh, the notion is that uh, Pike realized uh, what he possessed um, beyond the physical treasure, the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom, and uh, he decided not to share it with the uh, the Vatican or the Jesuits although they pressed him constantly over his lifetime, but to share it with the the one person that he believed uh, understood and could maintain his secret, uh-huh. the Cloud Moore. And interesting enough, uh, Pike, Pike was, at the time, he was about 300 pounds, six foot two, long, scraggly gray hair, beard, he looked a little like Santa Claus uh, <laughs> versus uh, McLeod Moore, who was this rigid British colonel, um, uh, sent to British North America before the uh, the forming of Canada, the, the official forming of Canada, Confederation. And uh, uh, he, there couldn't be two opposite, physically opposite men if I tried to put them together in in a fictional story. Uh, as they say, sometimes facts is stranger than fiction. Yeah, well, yeah. So what happened to McLeod Moore? Um, well, in, you know, we follow Pike all over the place. Yes, McLeod Moore uh, died uh, uh, a, roughly a year before Pike in 1890. So the two almost shared parallel lives, in a in a way, and it was uh-huh. um, McLeod Moore. Actually, Pike fled to Canada uh, for two months after the Civil War until the pardon could be arranged uh, with the American president, and uh, it was McLeod Moore who uh, who had arranged the accommodations for Pike in in Canada, which is interesting again. Yeah, I, I just uh, so so these these letters were all written to McLeod Moore, and they went missing for a long time apparently until you came into they, possession they of them. That's right. They were in McLeod Moore's official files um, or records that were part of a depository with the Grand Chancery of the Knights Templar of Canada to solve a great priory. And unfortunately, they were just stored down in the basement for about a hundred <laughs> over a hundred years, and it was only through the uh, the um, the wisdom of our grand chancellor were these records uh, rescued from a flood. And uh, about seven eight years ago, I became the grand historian archivist for the Sovereign Great Prior of Canada. And I went through boxes and boxes, and you can imagine my amazement when I come across, across this file of uh, <laughs> letters. And I spread them out on the floor, and I read them, and I read them, and I read them, and I realized there was more to, than just cor- just a, a, a Masonic correspondence, a fraternal correspondence between between two great Masonic leaders. There was. These letters were written on so many levels, it made my head spin for a while. Well, did anybody have the responses? Is there any record of the of McLeod Moore's letters back to Pike? No, we've been looking for those. And we've been looking uh, through the uh, Grand Archivist of the Scottish Rite um, in Washington, D.C., and we can't seem to find any... Uh, Reciprocal correspondence from McLeod Moore. There must be, though. 
And that's a mystery in itself also. You may have a second book to this <laughs> series. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, yeah. I find it's it fascinating. Interesting enough, there's a, there's a lot of Albert Pike's records, uh, really, his life writings, that are part of the uh, Albert Park Library in Washington, D.C., in the Scottish Rite Building. So it's a mystery why uh, why we can't find the correspondence going the other way. Well, the other thing that, that confuses me terribly, really, is, first of all, um, I understand, you know, I, I understand his... Um, Allegiance to the to the to the first for the uh, first families. I mean, I, I think that's great. He saw a nobility there that that most people didn't. But but then he was in on the Knights of the Golden Circle, the assassination possibly of Lincoln, and 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 the Ku Klux Klan. So that's so that's such a a, a, a you know a di- it's, it's, it's a it's a it's, quandary. Yes, it's a real you. quandary, and you know, I've uh, as I say, I, I've spent years trying to dive into the mind of Albert Pike himself. Uh, any any Mason who becomes a thirty second degree Mason, Scottish Rite Mason in uh, in the states is given the sort of the penultimate uh, uh, book written by uh, Pike himself called Morals and Dogma. And uh-huh. in it, he goes. In it, he goes through the 32 degrees. And this man was self-educated. He spoke 15 different languages. Seven or eight of them were extinct. Um, he was such a learned man, uh, so well read. Uh, there's almost an inherent conflict between his actions, earlier actions, and his later actions. And he is just such a complicated enigma. It's it's fascinating in itself, um, and uh, you can you can appreciate why he's uh, considered the devil still to this day by uh, certain people, and he's almost considered to be uh, godlike uh, to others. And that's what I'm was trying to. I'm sure he was yeah, married. Was he mar- yeah. Uh, was he married to? Um, it would be perfect if he married a Native American. No, no, it wasn't. He was married to oh. uh, Hamilton. Oh, so my. he married. He married. He married into a very good family. Yeah. It's, so it's, <laughs> everything well, you know, across the board is a contradiction. There's questions yeah, I mean, upon he, questions upon questions. I mean, the first families, you know, trusted him to um, to to kind of make their plea to the government. And you know, though he tried, it didn't do any good. The government, at the time, you know, had no respect for um, the first families. But you know, I, I just to to have that kind of respect for the first families and then to also be in, involved in i mean we were wiping out the families the first families we were giving them smallpox we were destroying them we were we were killing them off and putting them on reservations with no respect to their culture and yeah so how, part, how and could part we, of the reason and part of the reason why i've written this book i think you can i don't know if you remember that uh, my mother is uh, a Gonquin Indian. Yes. And I so do. I consider myself to be native myself. Um, First Nations, and I'm a member of the Medewin, which is the Ojibwe Grand Medicine Society. And as uh-huh. you say, I've, I've experienced it myself through the rituals of the Medewin, the seven fires, uh, are very... You know, they're almost mirror images of the Knights Templar rituals without the Christ- Christianity associated to it, with it. But, you know, uh-huh. the rituals, the Knights Templar rituals have been Christianized over the uh, 17, 1800s. hundreds. Uh, there's older rituals, ancient rituals that are more, um, more relating to the Christian mysteries than Christianity itself. So... Um, 
it's it's interesting in that uh Pike recognized the the guardians um recognized the spirituality in the First Nations people, very similar to the medieval Knights Templar. Just just out of curiosity and, and you know, don't give away secrets um that you're not supposed to but but I know that a lot of the the Blue Lodge especially deals a great deal with with Solomon's Temple and the the uh, the, the um, Ark of Arch of Enoch or yeah the Arch of Enoch yes, yes and is there a similar I mean you know certainly the first families you know didn't really know or care about um, unless of course the Templars told them about it I mean. Are there early degrees as as um, closely associated with um, with with the Knights Templar? In, Let me in tell other, you in this, other words, uh, it may yeah, it I, may be the other way around. It may be the other way around. The First Nations people uh, practice the spirituality and belief. Uh, there's a little known series of keys, I would say. They're called the Little Keys of Solomon, and they talk uh-huh. about five elements. And those five elements uh, really can go back thousands of years. There's astronomy, there's dualism, there's numerology, uh, androgyny, and then there's a hit fifth element called etymology, which is the play on words. Um uh-huh. If you can virtually apply those five little keys to any level of ritual that you that you've experienced, both on the native side and on the Knights Templar or the uh, Scottish Rite or York Rite free, um, Masonic sides. So there's a common origin. Now, did that did that information? Did that knowledge develop? In, in two separate worlds, possibly did it, did it come together? And was you know this is the whole thing in terms of the Knights Templar coming and arriving on the northeastern seaboard and say the uh, 1100, 1200s, 1300s. Uh, uh-huh. A lot of people assume that they they would have been dominant over the Native Indians. There's no way the Native Indians uh, received them as their blood brothers because they knew the signs, as I say in the book, the signs, seals, and tokens uh-huh. of the uh, of the wisdom of the uh, both the Templars and the Natives themselves, ancient wisdom. So prior to even the first Templar voyage here, they had um, the spirituality and the belief system and and it all already in place before the first Templars got here. Well, we, absolutely. And remember, too, there were transatlantic voyages <laughs> occurring over a thousand years, pre-Christian oh, yeah, times. That's true. So there would have been trade both ways between Native North Americans and the, um, let's call them the uh, uh, civilizations of the European and Middle East. There would have been well, the Carthaginians, the Phoenicians, the Romans, the Greeks. You know, you talk about Jason and the Argonauts. Maybe the yeah. the legend of, or myth of Jason and the Argonauts was actually based on a voyage to North America. Well, there's there's such a commonality between, you know, ancient fables and everything for all over the world. So, so there, you know, you. Yes, I go along with the fact that there there was probably a a commonality that got spread out over time and got interpreted through different philosophies and stuff. I I've often believed that uh prior to Europeans coming to this country that the spirituality and and the cosmology of the first families was so far ahead of what was being practiced in other parts of the world. That that it was heartbreaking. Absolutely. You know when when the Europeans came and decided to um, to civilize this culture without paying any attention to what this culture was, and um, 
you know, I, be, I believe the Europe, personally, I believe the Europeans were invaders. They, they weren't here to colonize. Uh, no, they were I, here to... Absolutely. And uh, people ask me, why am I talking about this? Well, you know, on the Native North American side, I've gone through certain rituals where, and I've gone through fasting ceremonies where um, the elders of the, the shamans have interpreted my dreams and they, and I've been sort of given the objective or the goal of, of trying to spread the, uh, the real knowledge and understanding so people can open up to understanding the First Nations people as they should be. Yeah, I mean, you know, prophets for sure. And, and far more spiritual than Europeans. I mean, they, they lived with nature. They understood the stars. They understood the weather. They understood the land. They understood the animals. I mean, there was a greater synchronicity among them than, than, than today for sure. So, so, you know, I, I'm still fascinated with um, the letters. Were you able to discern the code that he was using? Absolutely. Now, it's taken me 25 years of moving up through the ranks of Freemasonry to be able to do that. And there's, uh, there's as I would say, there's a number of levels. There's... Uh, Masonic levels, Scottish Rite levels, there's Knights Templar, Templarism, there's Rosicrucianism. Uh, all of those elements come into play within the letters themselves. Wow. Now, the, you know, I've, um, I'm familiar with a lot of the titles that you have, but not, not with a, a Knight Companion of the Red Cross of Constantine. Where where did that originate from? Well, that's uh, known as the Grand Imperial Conclave. That's okay. uh, I would I would say most. That's probably the uh, Masonic uh, order that is most closely aligned with uh, Knights Templarism, and is known as collectively uh, Christian Masonry. Now, Christian Masonry, a lot of people. Uh, see it as a belief in Jesus Christ, uh, but uh, just as importantly, it's it's based on the Christian mysteries, the ability to uh, to conduct miracles, the knowledge and understanding, uh, which leads to a higher level of wisdom. I don't want to give away too much, but no, no, no. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, it it's. I find it um, fascinating. Well, the whole thing fascinating. Um, I, I don't know a great deal about masonry. I, my grandfather was one, and, and in trying to learn more about him and, and you know what what degrees he had and stuff like that, I spoke to a, lo- a lot of um, very kind men at you know the the, the nation on the national level of Freemasonry, trying to trace things down. And you know, the more I the more I learned, the more I became impressed by the fact that that it, it it isn't just a good old boys club; that it is an amazing journey of spiritual enlightenment that that men go on. And um, what I like about it is, you know, women make a big deal about ascension and spirituality and transcendence and stuff like that and the masons just go about it in a very quiet way which which is probably the best way to do it it's probably the best way to do it but unfortunately uh, membership in all the orders is lessening Uh Um, uh, I don't know if you remember from our interview a long long time ago that uh, my great uncle, who was like my surrogate grandfather, he was exactly what you described. He was a kind, gentle, uh, patient, understanding uh, gentleman. And uh, I now realize what it meant to be a Mason. And But the whole thing is, is nowadays, um, uh, men aren't men are prepared to dedicate their whole life. 
uh, beyond their family to Freemasonry. Uh, a lot of the old guys still, you know, 80, 90 years old, they're, they're amazingly sharp. They, and, and unfortunately this pandemic is killing them because they live to go to their meetings. Some of them uh-huh. go out six nights a week, six nights a week. They're involved in everything on a national level. And they they are very successful businessmen, kindly kindly gentlemen. But I say to them, I and I and I do a lecture um, uh, to various orders, and I said we can't be secretive anymore because we are losing that membership. People do not appreciate what we can offer in terms of fraternity, in terms of brotherhood and development of yourself. Um, and that's, we have to change. We have to stop being so secret. Well, I think the one thing that that, that has always fascinated me now is, it's, you know, the country is a couple hundred years old, and Freemasons have been um, a part of the development of the country, a part of the development of the laying out of Washington, for sure, and and even you know New York, and and there there have been there have been high-ranking Masons in many positions, in order to guide the country from the shadows, so to speak. And probably and, more probably more than any of us ever realized. Yes. Yeah, and and, and so I, I'm wondering, you know, as as we as we grow as a nation, how many people who are now in powerful positions are still Freemasons? Well, I, I, you know, I don't think that's the case now. That used to be maybe a hundred years ago, but it's not the case now. Actually, I, I would say that uh, uh, certain respective governments have have not been hijacked, but have been in influenced by other factions um, to the point that uh, it's interesting. I, uh, I just finished watching on the History Channel uh, a miniseries with respect to George Washington. And they virtually made no mention of Washington being a Mason. They Obviously, they didn't want to approach it or didn't want to deal with it. But, you know, the basic tenets of Washington's whole life, whole character, were based on his Masonic involvement, as were yeah. a number of the founding fathers of America. And uh, people are forgetting that. People, people are not seeing that. The, you know, the Declaration of Independence, the presidential oath of office, is all based on Masonic tenets. Maybe and, I can and, maybe I can talk maybe I can talk about that because I'm Canadian. Ah, <laughs> well, well <laughs> I think what what gets me is that even as recently as um, the the um, was it the the Vietnam Memorial um, the, in Washington, it it is so placed so that the shadow of um, and World War II memorial, as, as as when the when the shadow of the um, the um, Lincoln Memorial, no, not what? the Lincoln, the Washington the Monument. Washington when Monument? The sh- yeah, when its shadow crosses over certain, it, it crosses over certain places at certain times, and and it is significant as to you know events that have happened. So there are Freemasons that were involved in helping to make this choice and decision of placement and and all sorts of things so that so that you know as as recently as that um there has been some symbolism that has been put into our country for for those with eyes to see so to speak so that so that you know you kind of think you know i, I I can't believe that, that there aren't Freemasons in power someplace that still have um, influence because to have lasted this long with influence 
that is subtle, but there, and to suddenly not have it now just just boggles my mind. Well, I, I I don't want to go into you shouldn't go into this whole conspiracy thing now. People will be looking for masons under pillows type of thing. Oh but, geez, uh, no, I don't want that to happen. But but the, no, the thing no. is that this country has been built on a very noble group of men, and and I think they're still out there. Um, but well, I did. I'm, I'm I, glad I, that they, they are out there. They are out there. And I know all of them, and they're, you know, the finest gentlemen that anybody can meet. And maybe everybody would listen and say, oh, yeah, you, you can say that because you're partial or or uh, influenced to the point of you're one of them. But uh, uh, it's, it's it's interesting that you picked up on, on that. I always say to people, I always say, Always look beyond. Whenever you think that you come to the reasonable conclusion, always uh-huh. look beyond because there's a higher level of uh, spirituality or degree to it. But it's interesting. You're right. You know, there's, there's, as I say, there's two different ways of looking at Freemasonry. There's a speculative way, and there's the operative way. There's, you know, how the from an operative point of view, how did the engineers, how did planners lay out everything from Washington? You know, there's symbolism right across North America. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's, a great, it's a great time for myself as I, as I travel across the country and around the world. Uh, the symbolism just stands out for me because I've learned to see the signs um, through, through the teachings and through the spirituality. And uh, well, it's and an amazing thing to under, to understand how mankind can actually apply that knowledge on on a oh, higher yeah. level, on a more subtle level. And that's what people should realize is that there's there's an amazing opportunity to rise above some of the mundane things that we have to deal with on a day to day basis, and this well, step back and to to think about things. Uh, as you say, with the eyes to see. Well, it, what I think is is um, is fascinating is is that you know you you said in your talking points that there could be rep- repercussions from extremist groups about this book. Why why, why do you think that? Because of the Pike well, letters. Because, because of the Pike letters itself. If uh, as I say, I I no longer have the Pike letters in my house. And, and uh, um, it, Pike is such an extreme character uh, on so many different levels that he, you know, he will attract all very different factions, and uh, he still does to this day. And it's interesting that his statue stands outside the Scottish Rite Building in Washington. I'm amazed when there was, and it's died down now, when there was this um, uprising to remove all the uh, Confederate statues, you know, it was a point of history um, that I don't know if the United States is ashamed of it, but if you if you start removing history, you're bound to repeat it again because you, there, it's not there for the lesson to be learned. I much well, yeah, I would I, much rather have the, the statues remain as reminders of what maybe what shouldn't have happened. Well, Pike not was, only that, Pike was an interesting guy. Pike wrote a number of papers on, and it's interesting that uh, we seem to be going through it um, once again through the pandemic. He wrote a number of papers on on the Constitution and the ability or the the power of the states, independent states, versus the federal government, federalism. And uh, we seem to be uh, seeing signs of that history being repeated every night over the last well, three think, months. Oh, geez, yeah. And I think one thing a lot of people forget is a lot of those <laughs> Southern generals and, and you know first of all a lot of them went to West Point 
and they just happen to live yes. in the South. I mean, yes. it's you should. It's a part of our history, and to me, as you said, those who don't pay attention to history are doomed to repeat it. But, but I, I don't think that it's in any way. Um, anti-American to have a Confederate soldier statue. I think that that um, you know it's surprising they're not going to take down Grant's tomb. Now that I think about it, but um, you know, and nobody suggested that yet. But but it just yeah, doesn't make it. sense watch to me. Watch what you say now. <laughs> yeah right. But it doesn't make sense to me why they are. I mean, did they have nothing else to do with their lives that they that they would make stupid that they would declare stupid things like this because they're, these were these were men who were dedicated and fought for a cause. And and, and, and they were and, and I want your And I want your listeners to also understand that it's not just the United States. You know, we were British North America at one time uh-huh. and before that. And we're, and we're, I consider myself to be an inhabitant of Turtle Island from a native point of view. But if you look uh-huh. at Canadian history, our first prime minister, John A. Macdonald, he was a Knights Templar himself. But John A. Macdonald probably introduced the the single most damaging element in the genocide of the the First Nations people in North America, the railway. Now the ah. Confederation and formation of the of Canada. Uh, one of the things that Macdonald had to promise the British that he would form or uh, coast to coast, he would build a coast to coast railway. And uh, when you think of it, there have been, there have been a lot of native um, uh, protests concerning various statues here in Canada, including John A. Macdonald. But to remove, I, I as a native American say to remove that statue would obliterate history as we know it, and and how can we learn from that? Yeah, we can't. And <clears throat> I think one of the other things in the book that that I don't know if it was you're being creative or reality, so I, I have to ask, um, was that the Louisiana Purchase was made intentionally to make sure that the the crypt that all of this the Templar material in became a part of the United States. Well, it's interesting. Thomas Jefferson, who I consider was to be one of the most enlightened Masons um, ever, and again, people will say, well, he's not a Mason. There's no proof per se that he was a Mason, but I can tell you all the elements were there, and he demonstrated. Uh-huh. But he he uh, arranged the Louis Louisiana purchase um, for a variety of reasons. Now, it went on again through manifest uh, destiny to almost obliterate the First Nations people. But on the other hand, uh, it preserved possibly on a number lo- uh, another level the, uh, the last refuge of the Knights Templar. So maybe there's an, something indicative in that, in that move, that political move itself. It's, it's, maybe it's so much, you know, it's so much fun to take a look at history and be able to, you know, see things more clearly as to why they happened and how they happened. Because um, <clears throat> didn't didn't we borrow money from? the English to pay the French for the mm-hmm. Louisiana Purchase. So, yep. so um, in, in and, many and ways, go ahead. <laughs> no, what's, what's interesting, I was just going to say, for the, you know, on a, again, if you look at history, if you look at the American Revolution, um, from a numbers point of view, and until the French um, came into the war on the on the side of the states, uh, the British far outnumbered strategically, militarily, everything the the Americans. Uh-huh. Uh, now, most of the high-ranking British 
officers were Masons. There's accounts of certain battles where they would call off the battle and and have throw up a tent in the middle of the battlefield and have a Masonic meeting. Oh wow! So you have you have to wonder what was you know uh, what was actually being discussed at that time. So you have to look at history with it in a different light all the time. And this is what I found fascinating. I've been a student of history all my life and uh, and a voracious reader, but uh, uh, I find when you start applying sort of the hidden levels to it, it does. It it, be, it makes it more fascinating. It's it's fascinating to speculate on on certain levels, but there's a lot of evidence that uh, would back up your speculation. Well, you know, you know, your your book is you know basically um, searching for the last refuge and and the treasure or treasures that would rest within and. And I wonder if 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 people had had heard that the you know the, the treasure of the Templars. I mean, who started the rumor that it was the treasure of the Templars was gold and jewels and all of that stuff instead of just you know papers well, that, that could is- turn the world on it, on its end, you know. Well, that's interesting. Maybe the Templars did that themselves. They they were amazingly strategic in terms of the information or disinformation that they put out of there. People ask me all the time, what do I think the Templar treasure is? And I say, if you take the top 25 sort of theories in terms of what the Templar treasure is and maybe take 5% of each of that, put it all together, that's what the Templar treasure is. But I always mm-hmm. challenge people to always think about the treasure as as something beyond the physical, beyond the gold and silver, beyond the even beyond the genealogical records or bones and relics or artifacts. What could what could the Templars have discovered or or rediscovered that that would have scared the Vatican to the point that they moved to obliterate the Templar order itself? That's a that's a good point, and and you know I don't think it had anything to do with with you know riches, as far as gold and silver and you know the the candelabra from the temple and the ark of the covenant and I you know I never thought that 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 was the treasure. Um, it doesn't make sense because, um, you, you know it's just money. And, and and yes, it has power connected to it, but it's just money. And, and to me, the, the first of all, it doesn't make sense that the Vatican um, was so against anybody discovering that stuff. And it couldn't be because they they were you know concerned about the money. Because like I said, it's it's just power. It's you know you can buy an army or whatever. But but the Vatican is is so against the Templar treasure being found. That that there are there are books written all over the place how the Vatican is against it being found. Now, if if there are that many rumors, then then the Vatican probably is against it being found. I would think. Uh, on the so other hand, could, if it is found, if it is found, yeah, the Vatican would be the first to claim it. As well, it's well, yeah, and then rumors. we. Well, they would. They would. Well, look what they did with the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, how many how how many years was it before we saw any of the, any of them? Absolutely. Or, or the, the whole thing. Or the trans- and, and we talked about. Sorry, and we talked about this earlier. Uh, from a spiritual point of view, the First Nations people recognized that the Knights Templar possessed that same knowledge. Now uh-huh. they're. We, you know, we talk about Enoch and uh, and other prophets and other biblical stories, but the basic the basic form of ritual for Freemasonry is the rebuilding of metaphorically Solomon's Temple. Um, 
you know, the natives have, we have our own uh, legends or myths about the great flood. Uh-huh. Uh, perhaps there, perhaps knowledge that existed prior to the great flood has been preserved. And there are stories or legends of that knowledge being, being preserved within the two pillars of Solomon's temple. And perhaps I, I like, it's, that, it's that knowledge that's been rediscovered. You know, I like to think that that what they may have found there were um, was stuff that that came from um, the, uh, the the Library of Alexandria that was saved from there. That some of that ancient before the flood material had been preserved. I mean, because let's face it, if it if it really was lots of gold and lots of silver and all of that and jewels and all of that, I I do believe that first of all the first families wouldn't have been as inclined to protect it because they are they are um, they are sworn to protect it. And, and I don't think that, that that they would put that great value on on a whole bunch of of gold and silver. I think that it has to be information and wisdom that that is precious and and needs to be preserved because uh, they're they're not they're not into materialistic stuff. So they wouldn't guard materialistic stuff for that many for the, you know the, that many. What hundreds, thousands of years? It just wouldn't make sense. And in, in, no, you're right. And the medieval Knights Templar, they believed that uh, uh, they were the first to believe that there was order in nature. Uh-huh. And uh, and if you can control that order of nature, that you possess the ultimate the ultimate weapon. Would you use it? Probably not. But you know, there was always that ability to. You know, could you create earthquakes? Could you create the natural destruction? Uh, right now, I believe that uh, Mother Earth is, uh, people are saying, talk about the the origin of the COVID. Uh, you know, perhaps Mother Earth is, is reacting to uh, the abuse that we've heaped upon it since the Industrial Revolution and is fighting back. But you know that's uh, pure speculation, but you're right in terms of uh, let's just say that there's sacred knowledge, sacred wisdom that is the mm-hmm. ultimate treasure. And I'm disappointed in people when they, uh, uh, you know, the Curse of Oak Island. They talk about the Templar treasure; they almost salivate over it. But that's pre- <laughs> but that's prevented when you think about it. That's prevented certain people. From looking beyond, from looking beyond uh, Oak Island to the mainland, to crossing the mainland, cross uh, always to the west across North America to the last refuge of the Knights Templar. Well, it just, you know, I will admit to watching Oak Island religiously, but. I do but it all the time, too. I, I also don't believe that they're going to find anything because. Whatever was there has been destroyed by water seeping into it. You know, they they found. Well, the, the funniest the funniest thing is they attribute the works. They keep on coming back to the Knights Templar. I know. They're talking about the they're talking about the medieval Knights Templar. What they don't realize is that the French and British army officers of the mid 1700s were Knights Templar. Uh-huh. And that, uh, and that there ha- has been this underground continuation from the medieval Knights Templar right through to the modern day. And uh, those, uh, there were field encampments that were occurring all across British North America in the mid 1700s. Field encampments where uh, Knights Templar degree was was uh, conducted and awarded to certain individuals. Now, obviously, you talk about people in, in positions of power who who were 
in greater positions of power than the uh, uh, the British and French uh, officers of the time, especially in British well, North America. Well, aren't aren't certain um, aren't there there ritualistic sites across Canada that that you know are are almost pinpoints where where the Templars were in existence where where they had buildings where they had forts where they had where they had married into the indigenous people and and aren't they still recognized today well they are recognized by certain people they're recognized by people like myself that have the eyes to see the signs um but more in most cases uh, the t- the foundations of the medieval templars have been built over um, and assumed uh, were assumed by uh, and in doing so they obliterated the, the trails of the medieval templars they were assumed by uh, again the French and uh, the British officers of the uh, 18th century the citadels the forts they were all it, built on strategically uh, well-positioned militarily uh, 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 perspectives, uh, landmarks, uh, outcrops, all of those positions were assumed for a certain reason. It's, it's, again, you're building upon earlier foundations, much like the Catholic Church would build upon pagan foundations. Yeah. But but let me let me go back to the foundation of the Knights Templar after after those nine no- knights you know created the initial um, Knights Templar the 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 original organization um, yes they they created the first banking system they became exceedingly wealthy yes where did that wealth come from because I don't believe they found um, riches underneath the temple. So where well, did that money come things, from? They, well, among other things, they discovered those riches. But those riches also came from, you know, their protection of the pilgrims uh, falling during the First Crusades and following the First Crusades. Uh, from the Crusades themselves, there's a lot of riches that you get from sacking and pillaging. You know, you have to realize the uh, Knights Templar were the finest military force of their of their time. They were ahead of themselves strategically, um, and from a physical operative point of view, they were the shock troops of the time. Well, not only that, but when somebody joined, they had to give up all of their all of their possessions. So. <laughs> And uh, a lot of my a lot of my ancestors, uh, French lesser nobility, the, the second sons would always go into the Knights Templar. It was the thing to do, because the first sons always got the estates. Right. So it just you know I I wonder where that treasure came from that was that was that was smuggled out before Friday the thirteenth. You know what? Where did that treasure come from? Was it was it just they built up over time this this amazing amount of money so that the French king you know was so in debt to them that he had to destroy but them again, rather than pay? You know, again, you're thinking that only the treasure was physical in terms of gold and silver. Uh, the treasure oh, no. constituted uh, no. The treasure constituted a number of things. Uh, uh, a lot of the things that were discovered under the uh, the ruins of the um, the Temple of Solomon in uh-huh. Jerusalem, the Talpiot well, tomb, and and you know there were relics, there were records, there were records from the Library of Alexandria, all of those things. Because uh-huh. there were thirteen ships that sailed out of La Rochelle. Yes. So, so that so that you know it, it's a matter of. What hit America? What 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 was secreted here? And and in many ways, I think you said that the the treasure was put in many different places and then reassembled here in the United States. Yes, it was. Uh, it was initially distributed amongst uh, uh, places like Denmark, Scotland, England, 
Portugal, the Knights of Christ, but also a portion of the treasure came directly to uh, North America. And and over time, uh, certain certain Templars were tasked with reassembling the treasure and mo- and constantly moving it. Wow! What 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 an amazing organization and what an amazing feat over several hundred years. And and then to That's, eventually, you know, what what dedication? I mean, and not only that, but but the fact that the the crypt has has never been, to my knowledge or yours, I would think, has never actually been discovered or reopened. Not the ultimate vault. There's the okay. ultimate vault with. Which contains you have to remember that the the um the aim was to rebuild Jerusalem to establish uh-huh. a new Jerusalem and to rebuild not only metaphorically but physically a new temple of Solomon in a new Jerusalem, and you would need certain relics, certain artifacts, certain records to sanctify that temple. And that was the ultimate aim. And to have, as you say, to have the forethought or the vision, uh, centuries, of recognizing that it may take centuries in order to do that. But over and, time, and, history and, is... Yeah, and when no, you look at... When you look at the fact that, okay, this is, this is supposedly a massive, quote-unquote, treasure... I mean, there have been times during that time frame where treasure would have come in handy, and yet it was not revealed. It was not brought out into the light. And so, so you know, my question is, okay, as far as, you know, as far in my mind, and I can see how revealing a lot of the... Um, Information, spiritual insight, all of that wisdom, bringing that out into the light will most probably, I mean, it could collapse the Catholic Church. It would It would ultimately destroy the world, I believe. So the Templars made the decision that they would sequester that treasure and, and just the knowledge that the Vatican, you know, uh, had that the Templars possessed those secrets was enough to bring them in line. But having something that could destroy the world, why not destroy it and not tell the Vatican? Well, that's an interesting that's an interesting question. I think uh, there. I think the Templars also believe that there would be a time that that the treasure could actually be exposed. And I couldn't think of a better time than now that we need a reassurance of certain uh, certain things in our life, certain tenets that uh, perhaps the time to expose that treasure is now. Well, I, you know, I, I would think among other things, um, part of it could be something connected to energy, um, because. I think one of the things that people don't understand is if you go back 2,000 years and you talk about magic, you know, Jesus used magic or or the three wise men were really magicians. Um, <clears throat> you have to understand that that term magic back 2,000 years ago did not mean pulling a rabbit out of a hat. It, it meant um, astrology. It meant numerology. It meant... Um, you know, it, it meant clear audience and clear sensuous and being able to to uh, to connect to a higher being, um, to to take your consciousness into a higher consciousness spot where you could connect yourself to that that source of all creation. I mean, that's what magic was then, and and if if. Indeed, the Templar treasure has something to do with that kind of magic or that kind of information. 
you know, yes, it, it, I don't know that it would destroy the world, but it would certainly turn the world upside down. What you're talking about is what you're describing essentially are the Christian mysteries practiced by yeah. the uh, early, early Christians. And, you know, the major magician was Jesus himself. So, yeah, um, yeah I, you know, so there has to be, there has to be a time when uh, darkness is settled over the world that uh, maybe certain certain knowledge has to be reintroduced to the world in order to develop that uh, balance. And it seems a much appropriate time that uh, uh, right about now when there's a darkness settling over the world that maybe the time is uh, right for that uh, knowledge to be uh, rediscovered. Who makes that choice? Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. You have to ask yourself if that knowledge has been re- is rediscovered, who would lay claim to that? I think every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the Vatican would try to lay claim to that. Well, I, I think the Vatican would lay, lay claim to it because of its its um, religious history and and whatever. But whatever country it's in, now, now we you know we we think you you. You know, it's someplace in Montana, so that the U.S. government would want to take control. Or, but but it's it's of universal worth because it applies to the whole world. So, but but first of all, first, who makes the choice? Now we know the Masons, the, the Freemasons, know where it is. So no, I no, I don't think uh, the the bulk is. Freemasons don't know where it is. Well, of course because not. It would have been they, dug up if that was the case. Yeah, yeah, they've been following my lead. I keep on asking them if I, if I'm exposing secrets, and nobody said to me. They, <laughs> everybody has said, continue with what you're doing. Maybe I'm a pawn in all of this. I don't know. Well, in order to even have eyes to see, they would have to be a 32nd or a 33rd degree Mason. Well, I would That's suggest a... that, that I would I would suggest that they would have to be more than that. They would but, have but to, you know, they would have to be the highest level of a number of bodies, a number of degrees, number of uh, number of orders. Is, is there a Rosicrucianism is the the whole basis of Rosicrucianism is like in Freemasonry it's the rebuilding of Solomon's Temple uh-huh. uh, metaphorically uh, in Rosicrucianism it's on a metaphorical basis uh, the transformation of raw matter into pure light alchemical process. Okay. So again, energy. So I would, suggest, I would suggest to you that uh, only those those at the highest levels of a number of orders would have the ability okay. to to so, once, well, once so, you have once you have that treasure, what do you do with it? Yeah, and who controls it? And I think this was the uh, dilemma that Pike faced also. Pike uh, Pike probably realized that uh, uh, there were things associated with the treasure that would allow uh, the southern states to rise again. Okay. But he chose but not. He chose not to expose it. See, this is what confuses me. There is. A treasure and its wisdom, its energy, its 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 lots of things that that probably have no um, monetary value other than their antiquity and the information that they have stored within them. And depending on the level of consciousness of the person that is working with it, touching it, or or exposing it, um, it, it can be massively powerful. 
but you know, okay, it's being protected by amazing people. But is there? See, I was under the impression that that the the Masons were, you know, you you have European stuff and you have American stuff, you have North American, you have South American, so that so that there are, but they're not they're not really closely closely linked, at least from what I understand. There would almost have to be a world. Um, Panel group of of the highest degrees of different areas that would have to get together and decide whether or not to reveal the treasure, right? Yes, yes, I think that's a good idea, right there. So, if that's the case, what do you do with it? I mean. You know, you, you go to National Treasure and they said, oh, it, it goes to museums all over the world and yada, yada, yada with National Treasure. But this is something different. And, and yeah, you're looking at a, and, and you're looking at a world that is now reeling, reeling from, from a shift and a change and, and, and a plague. Um, but, you know, we've been in, in horrible positions before as a world and it was never never thought to be time to reveal it how do you determine when the world is ready to have this information that's that's the question that's a that's a very heavy question when you think about it that's the question i and mean who has I can, the, who has the right who has the right to possess it who has the knowledge and wisdom to deal with it? Remember, this this itself could cause immense upheaval around the world. Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe it, appear, it, it appears that it appears that we need to introduce about a rebalancing of the beliefs around the world. Well, you look at at the um, Nagharabi um, Library and the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was almost that they had to be discovered and then brought to the light that way. So is possibly this treasure one that, that sort of calls to be discovered when it's time as opposed to people saying and determining it's time? Do you think maybe the treasure determines the time? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, huh. in, in many ways, it could be a heavy burden to the person that uh, is looking to uh, unveil the treasure. Now, I know, well, that, I there... know that, that that appears very cryptic, but... Uh, there's some wisdom in those words also. Well, wasn't there a a um a Templar um party that 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 came to make sure that it was hidden and safe and then Mary yes. uh, Mary Weather also checked to to make sure that it was still safe so that so yes, that but, but neither party but neither party had the had the will or inspiration to unveil the treasure itself. Perhaps Meriwether Lewis did, and uh, look where it got him. Yeah, it's interesting wonder. to speculate. It's interesting to speculate, as you say, on the history, the potential history that could have happened or could happen. Uh huh. But Remember, look at it now. Go ahead. There's a whole series of religious factions that are going to fight back. Oh, geez, yeah. You, know, you, can, it, it, you can go down the hill. You can go down the uh, hole first, Barbara. I can. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's it's what responsibility? 
I mean, it gives you power, it but is. but you know, but but ultimate power co- corrupts ultimately. Ultimate, you know, ultimate power corrupts ultimately. So yeah. so it's 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 a matter of no one should have that kind of power, but to try to share that, it with others, you know. And that and that's the key it, right there. No one person possesses the ultimate knowledge uh-huh. of what of what this treasure is and where it lies. Well, how long did it take for the Dead Sea Scrolls to be made public? And still, there's argument over what you know what where Jesus kissed Mary. You know, so yes, and if you look at the Da Vinci Code. The, the, when the Da Vinci Code come out, Dan Brown sort of um, e- either you fell into the rabbit hole or you did it intentionally, but he twigged upon a certain psyche of, of uh, around the world, various religious groups or whatever. But mm-hmm. nobody talks. Nobody talks about the Da Vinci Code being fact anymore. It it was dismissed as fiction. It was dismissed as fiction, uh-huh. and uh, we went on our merry way. I uh, did it influence a major part of the world. No, a lot of people took from it whatever they wanted and moved on with their lives. <laughs> yeah, and and you know it's it's funny because. I mean, as far as as Jesus being married, it's almost a common, of course he was. Um, You know, people accept that as, you know, even though we have no proof of it, most people believe that he was. At least most people I talk to do. You know, it may not be the the greater majority, but... (laughs) um, But when 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 that come out as a premise within the Vinci Code, you know, everybody thought, oh, my, I was going to say, oh, my God. Oh, my God, that was, that's the ultimate secret. That's the ultimate treasure that the Templars possessed. And I've always said to people, and it's proven to be true, always look beyond. Always look beyond. Well, we'll look at- that's, one part, that's one part of the treasure, but has it really changed their lives? No. Well, look at Holy Blood, Holy Grail. I mean, they 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 did the whole genealogy and everything, and and then um, Da Vinci Code, you know, built off of that. And there have been, you know, novels and and whatever that have been built upon the Da Vinci Code. But that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. And and you know, I like to think that that. There's maybe even an express an, an, an explanation of Gobekli Tepe in there too, because you know that's another mystery. You know we're still discovering yes. so many mysteries around the world, and and they seem to to be discovered when it's time to stretch the consciousness again and again and again. Yes. And. And, and perhaps it's almost, a, it, it's almost as a prearranged plan. Yeah, and uh, you know, as as human beings on this planet, we we do have, you know, we have free will and we have all sorts of material at our fingertips. And it seems that we always get information when we're ready to deal with it intelligently. Hopefully. And I would su- and I would suggest to you that only maybe ten percent of the population has the ability to reason and logic to apply reason and logic to whatever is exposed. The other ninety percent don't want to. They don't want to be exposed to that knowledge, to that le- different level of spirituality. It's it's hard to think for oneself. Yes, and and you know many people would like to be told what to believe, as opposed to discovering what is truth. Yes. So so and and that's that's an amazing journey. I call 
I call those that, that, that are still the searchers and the seekers. Um, I used to call them seekers, and then I called them light workers, and then I, then I gave up trying to coin a phrase, but I've recently coined another phrase, which, which you know will become hackneyed as well, probably real fast. But, but for those people who have gone through that portal between the consciousness and the higher consciousness, they found the bridge to that link to the source of all creation. I call them bridge walkers. Actually, that's a, that's a, a really nice term. Yeah, it, and it, it will that's become really colorful. Nice I, to me, it, it means that, that, you know, you've discovered the inner bridge and it's different for every person so that it's not something that can be taught, but it must be learned. And, and that's the key there, and that's the key there too. The presentation of that information, if we go full circle back to the, the start of our, our discussion here tonight, is that uh, uh-huh. almost the information almost the knowledge ha- almost has to be disseminated in a storytelling way so that we can digest it, you know, little morsels of that of that inner light. Over a lifetime. Or lifetimes. Of course, you know, lifetimes. Of course, you know, when you're a teenager, you think you know it all. It's <laughs> only lately that I realize, it's only lately do I realize how uh, how my father was so intelligent. Well, you know, somebody somebody said that when, when they were a teenager, their parents didn't know anything, and and when they graduated college, they were surprised at how fast they learned. Um, yeah. It's, it's. I, I'm wondering if, if the thought, if the, if the information that there, if the concept that there is a treasure of information of inner wisdom and spirituality is hidden, and what if? It really isn't hidden in, in in Montana. What if it's hidden within ourselves? And and so the journey to find the treasure is a journey we have to take in our consciousness rather than physically on this earth plane. What you're describing is Freemasonry itself. That's uh, okay, that's so. interesting. Uh, that's interesting, and you know whether through yoga, through Freemasonry, through even moving into the wilderness, uh, living mm-hmm. in the wilderness, um, you know you can achieve the, that higher level um, in many ways. Whether well, I, it's going I'm just wondering the, cer- the First Nation ceremonies, all of those things really lead I, to. Just, on, uh, go ahead, sorry. It, and I, it, 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 I'm just beginning to wonder if the fact that there is a treasure that will change the world, that will give us power beyond belief, that that will enlighten us to a new way of living, is the carrot, and and that we seek, we know that there is a treasure, so we seek within ourselves to find that treasure. Well, what you're describing is the journey. Yeah. And the and the journey is everything. It's not what lies at the end, end of the rainbow, but following the rainbow. Yeah, I, I want somebody said to me. They suggested that I should teach spirituality and stuff like that, and I said, well, when I get to where I think I know enough, you know, I'll hang a plaque and see if anybody, you know, comes around and. And this person said, why is this thing anybody ever said to me? Um, didn't particularly like the person, so I'm not writing him a thank you note. But he said the, the, the most important thing that's ever been said to me, he said, no, no, you don't understand. It's not arriving. It's the journey that's the teaching tool. And that's true. You know, you, you arrive, and the only thing you discover when you arrive is that there's another journey. Absolutely. Oh. One of my uh, na- one of my very best native friends. Uh, you could describe him as a shaman, as a as a teacher, as an elder, as a sachem. 
Um, I once said to him, I said, can you help me on this journey? Can you show me the shortcut? <laughs> and he said, <laughs> and he just laughed and he says, no, there's no shortcuts in that life. So No. Out of curiosity, you, you, you have, um, you've, you've sort of pinpointed where this treasure, this vault is. Have you ever yes. traveled there to just, feel the energy, and did you? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, people would say, well, it's just a majestic landscape in Montana. <laughs> but there's there's much more there than meets the eye. Now, everybody will be, will be dashing to Montana. Well, a lot of people are in terms of the uh, pandemic anyway, from what I understand. Yeah. <laughs> But, well, no, now, but the if, whole de- but the whole decision is the whole I I stood on the spot and the whole uh-huh. and the whole decision is was it time to expose what was beneath my feet and uh, a little voice in the back of my head said not yet yeah and when you do when you do expose it maybe you have to do it in a different way. So in part, that's why I wrote the book. Well, you know, I think that that it's important that people realize that that you know, silver and gold is fine, and it can buy you really cool stuff. But when you're talking about your spirit, um, no amount of money can can do anything there. You you have to you have to look for the wisdom and and the insight and the connection within yourself. So. But I'm, I, I really strongly feel that there have been people throughout time that have had part of that wisdom, part of that knowledge, and it just wasn't time and, and humanity didn't accept it. Look at Nikola Tesla. You know, he, yes. was, he was all for giving away free energy, and not only was he shut down, but I think he was taken out ahead of his time. So it, it's, it's kind and of like... You know, what will society well, accept? And we're talking about, you know, we're talking about Albert Pike, and I think that's exactly the journey he was on. Uh-huh. He was, a, you could call it a journey of spirituality, self-realization, um, to a higher level. You know, he perceived, um, he perceived God, I think, in a different way than most people perceive God. That uh-huh. force in nature, Mother Mother Earth, the Creator, whatever, the Supreme Being, however you want to label it, that spiritual spirituality, but the ability to comprehend a force that's greater than all of us together, that is the true meaning of God. Joseph Campbell, um, I've read every book that he wrote. It, he he was an amazing. He had amazing mind. He was on a journey itself. He realized that only through storytelling, through legend and myth, could one comprehend the universe. And uh, he was one of those people that was very close to the self-realization. Yeah, and and you know, if I if I look around today, and if I um. I can't name you anybody that I feel that is so spiritual that could deal with the kind of spirituality that that is possibly hidden there. It would be really cool if they had the two pillars there, but I don't think that that's something that they were able to transport. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, you know, I think, and 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 I would I would say that I I really believe that there's probably material there that does go pre-flood. Because that would shake the world up, and you know maybe, but but see, I don't think the world is ready to be shaken up. I think everybody. I think so, we're. I, I no, I think we're getting there. I think people need or are looking for for something to explain why things are happening. To understand. Well, yeah, I, 
on a higher level. You know, to understand from a scientific point of view, we're being fed a whole lot of information. Yeah. And most most of it is is correct from a science point of view. And we're we're rushing to address this pandemic from a science point of view. But it's like everything else. If science is only one half of the explanation, there's a there's a spiritual force that you have to apply to that science. And that's a that's essentially what the early alchemists, early Freemasons, early Templars they were all looking to achieve that, that balance mm-hmm. in life, that speculative versus operative. You know, in, well, in think- all, of my, all of my background, all my engineering, uh, planning, forestry background, uh, it was all, it's all based on science. But I go out to the woods, there's a certain spirituality that I just, uh, just I move into a different level now that now that I'm I'm trained or practiced to do that, that uh-huh. most most engineers couldn't fathom. Well, I think a lot of people know the phrase that that we are not um, a human on a spiritual journey; we're a spirit on a human journey. Now, they know the phrase. But I don't think yes. they only, you know, grasp exactly what it is. Because once you get to that point, then your perspective changes tremendously. Absolutely. And so, what you're de- what you're describing are those men and women who, who, in my mind at least, are exceptional. Those are the gentlemen and gentle women of the earth. Well, I think the other thing that 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 you you brought out subtly, I think too subtly personally, was the fact that <laughs> that well, okay, um, that that the element of the goddess is here as well, and and the fact that the the goddess has been ever present within our reality as long as there's been a reality, and that that having a balance between the male and the female within each of us individually and then you know and then you know universally is part of the coming into balance and tune with nature you know it's funny you say i was i did it too subtly i i would say that suggest to you that i threw it right in everybody's face well i I you have you have to have the sensitivity (laughs) and the eyes to see yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think you could have gone further. <laughs> sure, sure, but uh, um, once again, in storytelling, let uh-huh. the people discern from that. You know, Freemasonry. A lot of, a lot of uh, people don't don't realize the basis of Freemasonry. Freemasonry is the sacred feminine. Yeah. And and a lot of Masons themselves would fall over themselves. To contradict me if I if and when I say that. Well, no, it's and then I point, true. then I point out to him, then I point out to him the obvious uh, symbolism within the lodge itself, and they're amazed that they didn't realize that even earlier. You know, they don't realize the goddess of the District of Columbia is Columbia herself. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's just it's it's. I think it's something that's very important, and I'm hopeful that it's coming back into people's consciousness that that um, you know, the, the the duality during times of great peace and prosperity and everything in time was the fact that there was a male and female. It was father, mother, God. It was goddess and God, and and that that um, you know. The, then the, they, religion took over with patriarchy and and women's influence, women's energy, women's essence was negated out and and hopefully it's coming back today. And the fact you, that, that you remember you remember that we were talking about the five little keys of Solomon. 
and they're yes. talking about androgyny. It, uh, dualism, the balance between male and female, between uh-huh. dark and light. Androgyny, the coming together of male and female. Yeah. I I can so, I consider myself my my wife completes me and hopefully I complete her. Well, yeah. It, well, that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, you I know. know I know. Yeah. Eleven o'clock. I know. Eleven o'clock at night. We're getting a little heavy here, but uh, I think right. I think there has to be more discussion about that. Oh, absolutely. I I think that it's. There's so much that is coming in into the light um, today, and and there are so many um, authors that are that are trying to point out, you know, a lot of important facts that that you know they're doing through works of quote unquote fiction, and you know it's like science fiction prepared us for the space age, and if we hadn't had science fiction, we wouldn't have been as comfortable as we are with ships and, and 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 teleportation and um, string theory and dimensions and all sorts of stuff like that. So I, I think you have to subtly give people material to the point where their consciousnesses can grip it and then that you plant a seed and then it grows within each individual at its own pace and time. Hence, hence the answer to the question that you asked at the start of the program, why did I feel it necessary to put the information within a fictional form? Oh, I think this will go further than your other books. And your other books were great. I really enjoyed them. But but this one, you know, I chuckled a lot here and there. It was like, I wonder if that's a dot that he put in there or if it's a real dot, you know, <laughs> when you were connecting them. <laughs> you did it brilliantly. You, you really did it brilliantly. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you very and, much. And, I, I would assume there's another book coming down the down the pike eventually, um, and and I would, and now that I said coming down the pike, I bet it's going to be. I bet you're going to go further into Albert Pike because I would love to read a biography of his. You know, done done from the perspective of someone who understood of, of what was going on within him as best you can. As best as I can, I'm still trying to figure him out. And uh, <laughs> you know, I think he, I think he's a treasure to the states because he, he, he's one of those that causes you to ask a whole series of questions on so many different levels. And he's not outside of Freemasonry in the states. He's not a well-known figure. Well, you know, those are the, those are the heroes of time. You know. They did their job. They did it well. They didn't look for credit, and and yet, you know, they they served a higher cause. And and there are, you know, I, I would think that that his his writings and his purpose, you know, here's the, here's the man who had a calling, and he knew that he wasn't going to get acknowledged for it in his time, and to a degree he did, but but not to the greater you know, the greater service that he provided. So, um Well interesting enough I've uh I've pointed out on many occasions to Masonic friends in the States that the uh, Scottish Rite building in Washington D C was essentially de- designed um to be the mausoleum for Pike's remains. Uh-huh. And people scoff at that. But when I point that out to them, they start to think, and and they've uh, they've actually agreed with me. So well, his you influence, know, it, his influence, and his his bearing amongst Freemasons is of the highest level. And wow. once again, secret. Not I wouldn't consider it a secret, but secretive notions of that nature should be should be exposed, should be should be distributed more widely than the information the current information is being distributed. I mean he's kind of I'd put him right up there with Prince Henry Henry Sinclair, you know? 
a different time, different place, but yes, I would too. Yeah. Amazing. Um, we, we are getting, you're right, we're getting close to 11. I want to let everybody know um, this is this is the last refuge of the Knights Templar. Is it is it now out? Did did we or has it been released? Uh, April the seventh was the official release date through Inner Traditions. Yes. Okay. It's now and, available. And you you can order it through Amazon, through Kindle, through any of the major bookstores, or through Inner Traditions at www.innertraditions.com directly. Yeah, I, I I do believe as you said it's it's something that should be read more than once for sure. And and also your other three books which which also are fascinating but they're not works of fiction. This one this one went real fast. I loved this one. Matter of fact, I read this in a day because I couldn't put it down. Um your website is www.templar templars New World. Okay. All one word right. dot com, yes. Dot com. And um yeah. do do check the book out because it is it's a it's a great read and it will be fun to read it more than once because you'll you'll tend to pick up other subtle cues that he's put in there and um there's a lot of really spirit oh, the powdered gold. Is that was that something that Pike actually did? Take no, not Pike, not Pike himself, but I have a number oh, of friends oh. that are actually taking the white powder of gold, and uh, they make claims about a whole bunch of things, including uh, giving them immunity against the COVID. And where can you get that? <laughs> wow. Well, you have to produce it yourself. You have to be an alchemist yourself an alchemist? to produce it. Okay, Absolutely. well, I would I would say that's something people should look into for sure. Um, not that the study the uh, the study of alchemy is a lifelong study, by the way, but um, the white powder gold is is really quite fascinating. It's something to check up on. Um, so I I do thank you so much. Um, your book was wonderful, and thank you for indulging me in all my questions. No, not at all. Thank you very much, Barbara. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, I'll get you back. We'll do this again. Um, (laughs) But I do want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank everybody for listening and joining in with us. Please check the book out. It's an amazingly good book. It really is a good read, and let's face it, a lot of us have plenty of time these days. So um, do check that out. This will be up on YouTube later tomorrow and check us out again next Monday and Tuesday Mark and I will be back each with a respective show thanks again stay well stay healthy stay out of trouble and uh, like they say on TV we'll get through this together good night everybody